Well, folks, um, this is going to be a different kind of video. This is a video that I have um, been considering for about a month and a half. I filmed it about a month ago. I, I started working on this video, and it I started basically tearing up halfway through. I, I couldn't get through the video. Um, it's been quite emotional, actually. Um, I know I, I sound like a goofball in my videos, and I do a lot of stupid things, sometimes deliberately, um, but I am a human being. And um, unlike all humans, I suffer the same tragedies that uh, other humans suffer. Um, some of you leave nasty comments on my videos, and uh, it's all in good fun, I'm sure. Um, but this is a different kind of video. Today we're going to remember the loss of a great man. A very intelligent, very smart, very funny, very charismatic individual that, um, that died unnecessarily. Too young at heart. If you guys know these pro this product right here, you know who I'm talking about. And it's very, very sad. John Bachman was the uh, founder, CEO, chief engineer, and um, basic <laughs> all-around uh, just sales and customer service guy for his own little company that he founded when he retired uh, from his own other business that he started. Anatech Corporation. He founded the company in, I believe, 1990 to create, um, I believe he started out doing databases for component um, cross-referencing and such uh, for the electronics service industry. And later on, he became a, um, an actual test equipment manufacturer when he came out with his Anatech Blue Ring Tester. I'm sorry, the Anatech Blue ESR meter, which I have one, but I don't have it in the house. It's at work right now. The Blue Ring, uh, sorry, um, ESR meter that he co-developed, I believe, um, it, it was a it was a spin-off from Dick Smith's product, and um, he licensed the firmware. I don't recall who it was exactly, but he had licensed the firmware and the manufacturing rights to this meter and um, started uh, selling them as kits and pre-assembled units uh, worldwide and very successfully at that. Uh, the Anatech Blue ESR meter is well widely regarded um, in the community of electronics technicians. And he also had other products that he started selling, one of them being this Anatech ring circuit tester, um, the high Q meter or the Q meter. Um, this is actually one that I had borrowed from John uh, a couple months ago, and I have to. I actually am going to buy this from his estate um, probably this week. Actually, I, I forgot I had it, and I <laughs> sure enough, there it is. Um, but John was an engineer. He was an engineer. He was a fireman. He was a a columnist. He was very politically active in the community. He was just one of the most active seniors I had ever met. I didn't realize how old he was until um, I until I read his obituary. To be honest with you, um, he was 71. John was killed um, when a texting young male, 20 year old, basically a boy. Um, was uh, driving by his house. John was getting his mail, and the kid actually swerved, um, distracted by his phone. He swerved and struck John, knocking him into his yard, hit him just, just right. And uh, John didn't really pass away immediately. It was after he had been sent to the hospital, and um, I believe it was actually, it may have been in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. I don't know for sure. His wife was with him. And um, and he passed away, thus ending a, a wonderful life, a loving husband, a loving father, 
just a great guy. Um, John, one of his first passions was electronics, and he became an electrical engineer uh, right out of, he went to college for it in the 1960s. I believe he graduated in 65, and um, he worked for Wang Labs. Um, if those, those of you who actually own a Wang PC, um, you owe John a great debt of gratitude because John designed the power supply in that machine. He, he's the one who figured out um, how to. I believe one of the, one of the key uh, one of the key things that he had figured out in this power supply design was how to make a power supply that had no noise, electrical noise. The one that uh, they had designed originally um, it was a high it was a very noisy power supply and John figured out how to calm it down but he basically designed the power supply from the ground up and um, I don't recall exactly which model machine his his power supply went into but I know he had a big role in in the earlier Wang PCs um, he worked for Dr. Wang directly, designing um, calculators and other part, other components uh, in, in their machines. This power supply is one of John's very own designs. Uh, he gave this to me several years ago. He was going to throw it out, and he's like, Hey, you want this? <laughs> Mike, sure, what the hell? It looks dangerous. I want it. This is a variable power supply with a coarse and fine adjustment uh, built on breadboard very very crude he just needed a power supply for a specific project and this is what he designed but this is his very own handiwork something he built cobbled together on his bench in his free time very cool it's not grounded <laughs> it's very dangerous i've never plugged it in but i'm never throwing it away i'm keeping it forever um, I might actually put it in a case uh, because it, it just it's so fucking dangerous um, <laughs> just the way it is um, yikes anyway but this was his this was something he he designed Let's see it has a 10 volt constant a 5 volt constant output and a 1.6 to 9.6 volt variable output this is just really handy and uh, basic on-off switch, um, exposed everything. I mean, this is about as dangerous as they get. But it works. I've used it. Um, actually, I did use it. I, I think I... I know I early said I didn't plug it in, but I, I actually have used it once. So, again, this is, this is uh, something that... This is what he does. He's a tinkerer. He's a gardener. Well, was a gardener. Um, he was starting a little... Uh, small farm in his in his in his property and he built this greenhouse out of um out of a harbor freight greenhouse kit and that was one of his last projects uh for his garden i believe and what happened was during one of our windstorms uh just before he passed away half the panels blew out of the damn thing and he <laughs> made this really funny commentary on facebook about it um just a he's such a funny man very funny very funny he could turn anything into a joke. I mean, not many people can do that, and that's a, a large sign of intelligence. When you can turn any situation into a joke, you know, it, it just shows that you're you're comfortable as a human and you're just very intelligent and always on the ball. Um, so, I know recently he got into the clock restoration hobby. And uh, I brought my old 1886 or 1860, 1847 Boardman clock, the one you see over there that's kind of looks like it went through the Civil War when it actually did. I brought that over to him to see if maybe he could help me restore the mechanism. It needs all new bushings. Um, and uh, we were going to work on that and never got to it. We're like, oh, we'll do it another time. I'm busy. I got other stuff going on. At the time, I was restoring my scooter. And I was going to hold off on the clock. I wish I hadn't, but, you know, that's when you get regrets, and it's not, it's not worth regretting, you know. The time that I spent with John was, was fun, and um, you know, I, I'm glad I got a chance to, to not only meet him, but to work for him. I worked for John directly for about a year, and then we started working on side projects together, doing, um, well, for example, the videos. John approached me. 
uh, about a year ago, saying he wants to become the next Mr. Wizard. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> we can go somewhere with this. So, I'm terrible at making videos, I'll admit it. My videos suck. Um, they do, because I don't put any effort into them. So, I had to figure out a way to put some effort into his project, because I wanted it to look good. So, we created these videos. Spur of the moment, he comes up to me and he says, Here, put this on. I'm like, what's that? Oh. <laughs> he wanted me to dress up as... Um, Oh, Jorg Ohm. <laughs> and I had to, on the fly, come up with a German accent. But it was hilarious. Um, videos, by the way, that I'm referring to, I'm going to link on, I'm going to put links on the, um, on this YouTube video, and you'll see what they are. But we did some hydraulic theory. That's what it was. We wanted to become, or he wanted to become the next Mr. Wizard, but he wanted to do it with electronics and try to teach young people how electronics and passive components work, what goes into them, what do they do, and what happens if this happens or if that happens. And then he wanted to demonstrate them using a, an oscilloscope in real life, what a, a, an oscillator, a transistor, a capacitor, what do they do and how do they affect a waveform. Real, real, uh, real, real in-depth very smart man knew his stuff and um, it just our videos started having all these technical issues none of us owned a decent camera to do the film work and um, so there was a lot of compromises in these videos the very last video that we were going to do not the last but the next video in line we did one on capacitors and we did one on transistors and um, no, resistors. Resistors, then we did capacitors, and then I decided I wanted to make a video on the differences between and the benefits of a linear power supply versus a switching power supply. Because John knows power supplies. He designs them. Here's one example here. And um, I wanted to demonstrate the two so people can understand the differences between them. And, I, and of course, I was learning in the process how these things work and what goes into them. And so John had picked up or borrowed a power supply from a friend of his, um, and it's still sitting in his shop right now waiting for us to do the video, but unfortunately it's just not going to happen. I miss John, and um, I, I really hope that uh, some lessons can be learned as a result of what had happened. So as I mentioned, John was killed by a distracted driver. He wasn't charged yet. Uh, the trial hasn't happened. I don't know anything else other than what was read in the paper. Um, I haven't asked his wife. Uh, you know, I, I'm staying out of that. That's not my business. But what I do know is that here was a young kid, 20 years old, had his whole life ahead of him. Um, and through a split-second mistake texting on his phone. He took his eyes off the road, and by that point it was too late. He struck John, and um, he drove off. It was a hit and run. He didn't admit to what happened until the next morning. Um, John was found obviously injured by his wife, and um, Unfortunately, what happened was the kid didn't stop to, to offer assistance. He just kept going. He claimed he thought he hit a snowbank. We'll never know what the truth is. But if I can impart any piece of advice to anyone, young and old, is that distracted driving is to be taken seriously. You can kill somebody. You can you can kill yourself. You can kill some. You can kill your own mother and not know it. I mean, imagine if it was if it was one of his own relatives. I mean, despite who he who was hurt, who was injured, who was killed, um, the point is, really, two lives were lost: the kid who caused the accident and John, seventy-one-year-old, energetic, could have lived to be a hundred, sharp as a tack, all there, guy, uh, very, very, very good man. And the kid, I mean, you know, for the rest of his life, he, I mean, he'll be facing jail time, he'll be facing community service. I only hope, I only hope that he, he is 
either voluntarily does this or through some program, he can go to schools and teach children of all ages about the dangers of distracted driving. I would start at age 14, before they're even thinking about driving or when they're really thinking about getting their license in their first car. And make sure he drives home the point that not even for a second should you be looking at or texting on a device. Um, I mean, it's not just texting. It's other things. It's web browsing. It's playing games. It's talking on the phone. It's picking up the phone and dialing a number. These are things that cause distracted driving. Playing with the radio. And with the radios in modern vehicles, they're very complex. There's a lot of options, a lot of menus. And they're very distracting. And unfortunately, even GPS usage is, is a form of distracted driving. And it shouldn't be a law. It should be common sense. But apparently, I mean, even a law isn't going to fix this problem. There still will be texting and driving. There still will be distracted driving. Eating a cheeseburger while cruising the highway may seem innocent enough. But you drop a pickle, you bend over to pick it up, and before you know it, you're through a guardrail. Just, you guys, everybody, me, myself, and I... <laughs> have to take driving more seriously. I don't text and drive. I've never done it. I'll, I'll be completely honest. But I won't lie. I have dialed phone numbers while driving. And I have done that. I have um, played with the radio. I have picked up the phone and answered a call or made a call. Or um, I've done these things. And I'm now looking at myself saying, well, gee, you're not perfect either. But on that note, again, uh, if John, if you're able to hear me if you're watching this video <laughs> on your tablet up in heaven or wherever you are just know that I miss you and um, and I just hope that uh, I hope that some good can come from this um, because you were a terrific human being and um, I'm gonna miss you <sighs> well, anyway Sorry about that, guys. I know you were looking for a more entertaining video, but if I can impart any wisdom, this is it. Think before you get behind the wheel. Just think. So this is Mr. John Bachman, electrical engineer from Anatech Corporation, who is going to show us how hydraulic theory works and how it relates to how electrical current and... Uh... Yeah, the problem people have, a lot of people have, in understanding electronics is you can't see it. You have to try to visualize what it is, and that can be hard to, hard to do. But one way I've come up with to help people visualize how electronics and electricity works is to use water. Water follows the same rules as electrons and electron flow. And here with this setup here, we can simulate an electronic circuit using nothing but colored water. I chose electric blue, seemed to be an appropriate color for it. We have here power source. Okay, in electronic terms, that would be a voltage, a source of some sort, a battery or a power supply, or whatever. That feeds through the circuit. There's a pressure meter. This is measuring hydraulic pressure from the water. And as a matter of fact, if I increase the height of the water, you can see the pressure goes up. That's very comparable to electrical pressure, which we call voltage. Voltage is just electrical pressure. 
So that gauge, we'll keep an eye on that gauge as we go through this to see what the voltage is doing or what the hydraulic pressure is doing. Same thing. Now this rather complicated looking set of tubing represents a circuit. If you look, the supply comes here, it goes two different directions, and it splits up here again. Straight ahead we hit a valve, which is comparable to an electrical switch. We have this large tube. A large tube allows a large current flow. In this case, water current, not electrical current, but it's the same thing. A large tube, low resistance, large current. In the upper section, we've got some smaller tubes. They present more resistance to the flow. Higher resistance, less flow. It's the same with electricity. And through this set of valves, I've set it up so we can operate each one individually, or we can operate them in parallel, just like an electrical circuit, or we can even do some in series, like an electrical circuit. Further down the line, all of those flows come together here and go through this flow meter. Now this flow meter is just a valve in there that, that rolls around and the speed it rolls around is determined by how much water is going through it. And it puts out pulses. Those pulses are converted by this box to voltages that light up these lights. These are LED lights low, medium, and high flow from that, that uh, flow meter. And then the water dumps into this bucket and we use it again. So that's the hydraulic circuit that you can use to visualize how an electric circuit works. Let's try it out, huh? I've got some water in my power supply. I've got a little bit of pressure here. I'm going to turn on this valve to allow flow through the large tube and let's see what happens. Well sure enough we get a pretty good flow in the current and if you look at the little box all the lights are lit. It says we have a lot of current. Okay I'm going to recharge now. Okay now let's do a flow through one of the smaller tubes. I'll pick this middle one here that provides more resistance so we don't get as much flow. And there it goes, and you can see we've got a smaller flow here, and we've got only one light lit. That's a low flow. If we throw another path in parallel with that flow, now it's going through both of them. We've got bigger flow, and we've got two lights lit. Hmm. That's exactly the way an electrical circuit works. Now let's take a look at what happens when the voltage gets higher. In this case, Brandon is going to raise our supply source up and notice the pressure gauge goes up that is analogous to the electrical voltage going up and with just one line open we now have a considerably higher flow than we had before and we've got two lights lit. If you remember when that was down low, drop it down low again Brandon if you would please. And it goes down to one light lit because the flow is reduced. That's what voltage does. This all relates to Ohm's law. Now I planned on having a visitor today, but he hasn't arrived yet. He was going to explain to us what Ohm's law is. Hopefully he'll show up. So I was expecting a visitor to help us. Maybe that's it. Let's see who's here. Hello. Hello. I am Sure. I am so George Ohm. George, yes, Professor. That's yes, yes, right. Fun fact. Thank you for joining us. Did you know my name? It is spelled G E O R G. Z fell off. Anyway, I uh, I have a fascinating interest in electricity. You see, I wanted to create a way in which people could understand how electricity works, or the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. Ah, very nice. That is correct. So, what I have done. Is I've created the triangle, it is much like the food pyramid that you Americans have created for no reason. And it looks like this. Now, this is where your sugars and fats would be, and your vegetables would be down here. But that is not the case in this experiment or whatever. So, on the top, 
we have volts. On the bottom, we have amperes. And my favorite, resistance. What, what unit do they use to measure resistance, Professor? Ohms. Ah. That is right. Now, and if you want to figure out what the resistance is for the ohms of a circuit, what you must do is cover the ohms. And then you must divide E by I, so volts times amps. No, divided by amps. And it is, is the resistance, yes. That is right. Very now, nice. if I want to figure out what the voltage of the circuit is, I must cover up the E and then multiply the amps times resistance. Very simple. Very nice. Now, what if, why don't you tell me, Mr. Scientist Man, what I do if I want to figure out what the amperes is? Ah, I think maybe what you do is you cover the amperes, the I, which leaves you voltage E over the R. So you take voltage and divide it by resistance and you get amperes. Now is that, that correct, that, Professor? That, that is correct. Now what uh, I want you to do is stand 20 feet back and tell me what this is. What? <laughs> the E or the wiggle in the line? Too late, you already know. <laughs> So now you understand my law and how it works. Now I must be going as I have died 169 years ago. <laughs> Th thank you very much, Professor. Uh, we appreciate you coming back from the dead to explain your law to us. Thank you and have a nice day. <laughs> and now John is going to show us how the hydraulic circuit relates to a real electronic circuit. John? Thank you, Brandon. Here I've constructed a simple electronic circuit that is directly analogous to the hydraulic circuit that we looked at using the water. We have our power source over here with a positive voltage here and a ground or return here. That goes off to three resistors through these switches just like we had the resistance tubes and the valves in the hydraulic circuit. Down here I have a switch and a 100 ohm resistor. And this is a switch and a 1000 ohm resistor. And here a switch and a 2000 ohm resistor. Now let's, let's apply Professor Ohm's law and predict what's going to happen here. Oh, also at, on the outside, all the currents come together and they go through this voltage meter, which is and they go through this ammeter, which is this meter over here, and we'll see the needle, needle deflect when we turn the circuits on. But first, let's predict, using Professor Ohm's law, what the current's going to be when I put this switch on here, putting the 100 ohm resistor in the circuit, and sending that current through the ammeter. If we use the Professor's law, E equals IR, we're going to be solving for I, so we cover it up. I is E over R. I equals E over R. And I'm applying 10 volts, which you can see from this meter here. 10 divided by 100 ohms, which is 0.1 amperes or that's equivalent to 100 milliamperes. One milliampere equals 0 0.001 amperes. So we have 100 of those. That's 100 milliamps. Let's see what happens. That's what Professor Ohm's Law predicts. Turn the switch on, the meter deflects, it actually is a little bit shy of the 100 milliamp scale, and the reason for that is these resistors are not exact. They have a tolerance. This particular resistor 
has a tolerance of 5%. And that means its value can be within 5% of 100 ohms. It could be as low as 95 ohms, it could be as high as 105 ohms, and still be within tolerance, within its specification. This particular one seems to be about 105 ohms, which gave us a little less current. We'll get into that a little bit later. Now, what happens if we turn on another one of these resistor circuits? Watch the meter, and I'll turn this one on. Sure enough, just like in the water circuit, we got more flow, we got a higher current. We're up to about oh, 106 milliamps. And if I turn the final one on, it goes up even further, and we're up to about 110 milliamps with all three of those resistors in the circuit. Ohm's law works. That's how electrical circuits work. That's what happens in a resistor network circuit. Okay, John is now going to tell us about reading color codes on resistors, what they mean, and uh, how they affect your daily life. John? Thank you, Brandon. Well, if you look at any of these resistors, you see they've got a, several bands of colors. Those colors tell you the value of the resistor and uh, the uh, tolerance of it. And to read them, I've drawn my version of that resistor up here, it's got a red stripe, a black stripe, a red stripe, and then further down the other end, a gold stripe. First stripe you see is the first digit of the value. Second stripe is the second digit. And the third stripe tells you how many zeros to put after that. Here's the code to the colors. Black is zero, brown is one, red is two, orange is three, yellow is four, green is five, blue is six, purple or violet is seven, gray is eight, and white is nine. So we have red, the first digit, is two. Black is the second digit, zero. And then another red, which is two, Remember, that tells you how many zeros to add. 2,000 ohms. The tolerance codes are brown is a 1% resistor, gold is a 5% resistor, and silver is a 10% resistor. So this has a, that resistor has a gold stripe, it's a 5% resistor. Now, how the heck do you remember this? Well, there's been various little ditties that have come up over the years. The one that I learned many years ago is no longer socially acceptable, so I can't use it anymore. And I came up with one of my own that goes like this. Big boys reject our youthful gags, but Violet gets worried. Another one that's common is bad beer Rots our young guts, but vodka goes well. So you can pick your ditty or make up your own ditty, or even look it back into the archives and come up with a ditty that I remember. Just don't repeat it to anybody, especially in Nick's company, and you'll be fine. And that way you can remember the color code and you can re read the resistors. Now, why the heck do we want to learn about resistors anyway? What does that have to do with the real world? Well, it turns out all electrical circuits use resistors. Let's consider the little light box that we used when we were looking at the water flow. This flow meter puts out a set of pulses. And the frequency of those pulses is determined by how much water is going through it or liquid. It can be any liquid, actually. The more liquid, the higher the frequency. So this little box converts frequency to voltage to light the LEDs. And let's take a look at what's inside. There. If we look in this box, you see we've got several integrated circuits. Incidentally, 
this this is old technology way of doing this particular function, converting voltage to a D, or converting frequency to a DC voltage. But you see resistors all over the place in here. There's a couple tucked back in there. They're in there doing different functions, but they're all doing the same thing. What does a resistor do? It resists current flow. The value of the resistor determines how much it resists that current flow. And we use it in circuits to perform that function, and it's used in this circuit too. Now sometime in the future, we might uh, consider doing the same circuit using a more modern device, a microcontroller. We can replace almost all of these components with one microcontroller, and that might be the subject of a future video. And while we're here, we can look at these funny looking components. These are capacitors. And these capacitors, here's another one of a different type and another one of that same type. Emerald focus. These capacitors, again, perform different functions. You can also see there's some other components in this circuit. These guys here, these stand-up cans that are blue, those are capacitors. And it, this is a different kind of capacitor, and that's another capacitor. And in this circuit, they're performing you know, three or four different functions, all with the same type of component, but different values. Uh, and we can talk sometime about what a capacitor is and what does it do. Uh, why do we have a string of them up here, and why are they scattered around the circuit? They're doing different functions, and we can talk about that. That could be another subject of another, another video. Testing, one, two, three, testing, testing, testing. Good. It's good. Yeah. So this is Mr. John Bachman. He is going to discuss... Oh, we're starting the thing now? <laughs> <laughs> Wait for you. <laughs> there we go. There we don't go. Good. Okay. Where am I? I have no idea. In which it allows you to determine or explain the relationship between both. <laughs> anyway. Yes, the, the voltage and the current and the resistance. <laughs> that is correct, and I make the triangle like so. Now there is an E. And that is representative of the Excuse me, Professor, but I think you got your triangle upside down. <laughs> <laughs> it is my law. <laughs> I wrote the law. <laughs> Shut the hell up. And here to talk to us about how capacitors work is JB. Take it away, JB. Thank you, Brandon. Well, capacitor is another one of those mystery components in electronics that is hard for people to understand how they work because you can't visualize it very much. At first, let's talk a little bit about what is a capacitor. The uh, schematic diagram of a capacitor, the symbol, is actually quite descriptive. Looks like two plates with a wire connected to each of them and nothing in between. There's actually not nothing in between, of course, uh, but there's no electrical connection. So you have two plates that are very, very close together, separated by some kind of insulation that's called a dielectric, one of those fancy electronic terms. It's just an insulation, but there's different dielectrics used in different types of capacitors. So the way it works, because these two plates are so close together, something happens electrically on this plate, it affects what happens on that plate without there being a direct connection. And that's the key. 
Say for instance, I connected a battery. I'll put it through a switch. It's a crappy switch, but it'll, you get the idea. So when I close that switch, it comes down, current flows from the battery, this is the positive terminal of the battery, and piles up positive charges on this plate. Those positive charges repel any other positive charges that happen to be in the neighborhood, including the ones that are on this plate. So the current leaves that plate, and we get a balancing negative charge here. When it's all done, the charge across this capacitor, the voltage on that capacitor, is the same as the battery voltage out here. And that happened without an electrical connection in the middle, just the dielectric. What is the dielectric usually made from? Uh, the dielectrics are made of many different types of materials. There are ceramic dielectrics, there are tantalum dielectrics, uh, there's polypropylene dielectrics, all kinds of plastics are used. Uh, just about any kind of an insulator you can think of that has been used in capacitors, some more successfully than others. But think of it as just a simple, very thin uh, insulating material. Uh, for instance, I've got a bunch of capacitors here on my bench. Come in all kinds of different shapes, sizes. Here's a little tiny one. This one's in between size. And somewhere around the shop here, I've got some big humongous ones, but I can't find them right now. They're hiding somewhere. Big giant capacitors. They all look different, but they all work the same way. They just have different characteristics because they're made out of different materials. Now, I described electrons flowing around. We can't see electrons flowing around, but we can see water flowing. And here we are with a water-powered capacitor that I put together here for, to demonstrate how it works. On this side, this is our battery. It's not charged yet. I haven't put any water in there. Let's do that. Let's charge that battery up. Let me get some water. Now our battery is all charged up. But the switches out here, you see I've got two paths. I've got a big tube here. I've got a small tube here. We'll talk about why the, the two different sizes in a little bit. So wait a minute. Yeah. Does this mean that I can power my electric car on water? No, but you can power your, your water-powered car on water. I think that's been done. Was that, was that not done? I think they were called steam engines. This is true. Back when you were a kid, they used to make those. Yes, yes, I was a teenager back then. Really? And they were quite a lot of fun. I knew Mr. Stanley personally. Did you? The Stanley Steam Engine. Excellent. So, after that rude interruption, <laughs> let me continue. Got that, Brandon? Let me continue. <laughs> continue you shall. <laughs> so, we have this path for the water to flow. If I step over to the other side, we have a water capacitor. This bucket represents this plate of the capacitor. So that would be the positive bucket. Well, it would be once I put a positive current into it. Okay. Right now, it's kind of neutral. It's got a little bit in there, but not much. But you see, there's no water connection between here and this side. This is the other plate of the capacitor. And that's got the red colored water in there. I made it different colors so you could see. There's none of the blue water going to flow into the red side. But it is going to have an influence. Let's make it go, huh? This is exciting. All right. I'm going to throw the switch and watch what happens. Water is flowing. Bucket is filling up. And once it gets enough charge, the red water line moves down. So there's current flowing in here and there's current flowing out there, but there's no water connection between the two. Exactly how a capacitor works. It, oh, this is fantastic, isn't it? Yes, it is. Now, you say, what happens? 
If we want it to go the other way, let's try it out. I need my bucket. Otherwise, we'll have a big mess. If I take my battery and I make it a negative charge now, look what happens. The current flows the other way, in this case it's water current, and the red water flows up, back up into that plate of that capacitor. That's exactly what happens with a real capacitor in a situation where it's different positive and negative supplies. Perfect. All right. We'll turn that switch off. Why do I have this small tube? Let's make some marks. What we're going to do, I take these off, but that's for another one. I'm going to put a mark on here where the red water is right now. And we're going to time how fast that goes down when I open the big tube. First, I got to charge my capacity, my battery, don't I? Here we go. Count it out. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, 1,006, 1,007, 1,008, 1,009, 1,010, 1,011, 1,012, 1,013. There goes the red down because the float is going up now. 1,016, 1,017, 1,018, 1,019. About 20 seconds to get it to here. All right. Let's discharge the capacitor again. Switch off, recharge the battery. Now before we do this, let's talk about the difference between these two tubes. This is a big tube, provides very small resistance to the flow of the water current. This is a smaller tube, higher resistance. We're going to flow the water through the higher resistance into our capacitor and time it out to see how long it takes for the red line, red water to get from here to here. It took about 20 seconds the first time. Here we go. Is the water flowing? Yes, it is. But it's flowing slower, isn't it? Am I counting? No, I'm not counting. I should be counting. 1,006, 1,007, 1,008, 1,009, 1,010, 1,011, 1,012, 1,013. 1014, 1015, 1016, 1017, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. The red water just started flowing. 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. Come on, red water. Come on, red water. Come on, red water. We need the red water to be flowing. It is, but it's going very slowly. And you can, and that is the precise point of this part of the experiment. With bigger resistance to current flow, the slower the capacitor charges. It's charging. The red water is going down, but it's going very slowly because we've got more resistance in the circuit. That's the point of the whole thing. And that's a very important characteristic. That's exactly how electrical capacitors work in circuits with resistors. The value of the resistor, the value of the capacitor, the supply source voltage determine how fast things happen. And that can be used in lots of really interesting and cool ways. OK, let's shut this off. So what we did, first we did this charge thing with very little resistance in the circuit and saw how fast the, the capacitor charged up. And then we added some resistance in here and that slowed it up. That's a very important characteristic and we're going to demonstrate that in a real circuit in just a minute.
But before we do, let's talk about the values of these capacitors. What is the value used for capacitance? It's the farad. That's a funny term. It's named after Mr. Michael Faraday. Uh, and uh, he did some, some of the advanced uh, uh, preliminary work in electromagnetism. And in honor of him, they made the value of capacitors the farad. The value selected for capacitors was the farad in honor of Mr. Michael Faraday, who did some of the very basic early work in electromagnetic theory. What happens between these two places is electromagnetism, uh, static charges, that sort of thing. And he did a lot of the advanced work, so they named the value of a capacitor farad in his honor. And they defined a farad, F, as the ratio between Q and V. So Q is the charge on the plate of the capacitor in coulombs. It's another one of those funky words that named after another old dead guy. How do you spell that? Coulomb. Coulomb. C-O-U-L-O-M-B. Mm. Or something close to that. Thank you. Divided by the voltage. So if you have one coulomb and that develops a voltage of one volt, that capacitor value is one farad. Turns out a farad capacitor is humongous! Huge! Not a practical number at all. So, you get a capacitor like this, which is a very common one, and you read the value on it, and it says 47 mu f. What the heck is that? 47 mu f. Well, in electronics, a lot of scientific stuff. Mu means micro. Micro is one. one one million. That's a micro. Microfarad. This is 47 microfarad, so it's 47 millionths of a farad. That goes to show you how big a farad is. It's a big thing. And then some other, that's a common uh, value range, but you also run into nanofarads. And F. Nano is add three more zeros. A billionth of a farad, or one of my favorites, a pico farad, and three more zeros, and it's a trillionth of a farad. PF, puff, that's called puff. It's not puff the magic dragon, it's pico farad. Mm -hmm. Or back in the days when I knew Mr. Stanley of the steamer years, we called it the micro, micro farad, or if you really wanted to be cool, it's the Mickey Mike. But today, it's a pico farad. Common values. <laughs> this particular little capacitor here, if I can read it, is, it says 153K. 153K. 1530,000, so that's 0.15 microfarads, 150,000 nanofarads, 150 nanofarads. That's how the values work. All right, let's see some real electronic circuits now, right? Oh, who's that? Someone at my door. Oh, hello. Hello, oh, hello. yes. Every day. Like, Michael Faraday, hey, Professor, yeah. I'm so glad to meet oh, you. I was wondering if I could borrow a cup of sugar. Cup of sugar, certainly. Certainly. One, one moment, please. Here, here you go. It's blue water. Oh! Are you making meth? <laughs> no, I'm not making meth. <laughs> Weird. Well, anyway, um, I heard you were talking about me. They were talking over at the VFW launch because... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mentioned you earlier because you're, you were honored in, in having the value used for electronic capacitors named after you. What the hell are those? Uh, well, you'll have to watch the video on YouTube and I go through the whole thing and explain what they are. But your work in, in uh, uh, electromagnetic magnetic and, uh, and electrostatics was instrumental to the development of capacitors. Without capacitors, we couldn't have the electronics we have today. So we thank you very much and for that. And you named them after me. They named them after you, named the value after you, the farad. Wow.
That's quite quite nice, huh? That was an honor I did not expect. Well, and, and apparently you died too soon and, and didn't realize it. What are you talking about? <laughs> I understood that you've been dead for about 120 years or so. Oh my god, you're right. i got to get the hell out of here. <laughs> Okay. So here's the circuit that's the equivalent of the water circuit. Our supply is going to go in here. That is connected to two PES, two different resistors, a low value here, a higher value here, with a switch for each one so we can switch them in and out. And then those two are connected to this capacitor. And this loop of wire is just so we can connect the oscilloscope so we can monitor what's going on on this plate of that capacitor. We're going to use the oscilloscope to monitor that. And a little bit about the basics of an oscilloscope. Uh, this is the one that I use here all the time. It's a digital storage oscilloscope, which means it digitizes the input uh, signals and saves them so you can manipulate them, you can analyze them, you can expand them, you can send them to your PC, you can do lots of different things with them. Um, be kind of cool to see if I could send one to YouTube. We'll try that someday. Our oscilloscope is, is a voltmeter, but it does it in a graphical fashion. On the vertical will be the, the uh, voltage. On the horizontal is time. Time here, voltage there. I'm going to set the triggering on this oscilloscope. Triggering, what is that? The trigger is what starts the oscilloscope to scan. It will scan just one time and save that image and we'll see it. I'm going to set it to trigger on channel 1. Channel 1, I have this voltage probe connected, and I'm going to put that on that loop of wire. Okay, and down at the bottom, it gives you the scale. Channel 1 is 5 volts per division. Each one of these divisions represents 5 volts. And we're working with a 10-volt power supply, so that'll work out nicely. And the horizontal scale is 2 milliseconds, 2 thousandths of a second, 2 milliseconds per division. All right, let's connect up the uh, power supply. I have a DC power supply here right now. And I'm going to throw a switch on the low value resistor, and let's see what we get. And there it is. The oscilloscope triggered, and you can see the voltage on that capacitor went up, but it didn't go up instantaneously. It went up slowly. The speed that that goes up depends upon the value of the resistor and the value of the capacitor how far it goes depends upon the supply voltage. Let's try the other channel now. So before you start, we're on the 100 ohm uh, resistor? That's correct. We're on 100 ohms right now. And we're sending it through what? The capacitor. What is the value? Uh, that's that? a 2.2 microfarad capacitor. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. I'll clear the scope. I'll clear the scope. And we'll switch on the 1,000 ohm resistor. And look at that waveform. It's coming up much slower. That characteristic of capacitors and resistor circuits is used in lots of different ways, as we mentioned before. The fact that the resistance, the value of the resistance, the value of the capacitor determines how fast the voltage rises on the, on the capacitor. A uh, very important characteristic. Now let's look at another thing. Using the oscilloscope, I'm going to connect on channel 2. This is a current probe. Instead of showing us voltage, as we have on channel 1, channel 2 is going to show us the current that flows through this current probe. The arrows on the, on the current probe indicate the direction of current. I'll connect this up. to get my fingers in there. There we go. Okay, so let's take a look at the same circuit now with an AC voltage source. Let's draw a little circuit diagram of what we're going to do. We have an AC voltage source, which is usually drawn like that. The little symbol indicates it's an AC source, and that's my trusty WaveTech function generator. It's going to go through a resistor to the capacitor. 
like so. Okay. Now, what's going to happen with an AC source, because this is going up and down, just like with the, the water supply, when I went up and down, the current's going to flow in and flow back out. And the way that the capacitor resists that current flow is a function of the frequency of the AC source. It's a very important characteristic of capacitors. So the voltage across this capacitor depends upon the frequency of the source, of course this resistor which is going to drop some of the voltage, and the value of the capacitor will, will determine what its equivalent AC resistance is. Now we can monitor that here. I have set up two meters. This one shows the voltage on the from the AC source itself, That's right here. And this one shows the voltage across the capacitor, out here. I've got the AC source set right now for... Yeah, you see the lost power again. There's a habit in that. <laughs> I have the AC source set now for uh, about 200 hertz. That's the frequency. And I'm going to set the voltage at approximately 5 volts. There, that's pretty close there. Switch is on for the 100 ohm resistor. The voltage across the capacitor is 2.98 volts. So the AC resistance of that capacitor is roughly equivalent to the 100 ohm resistor because we're losing about half the voltage through the resistor and the other half is left for the capacitor. But if I increase the frequency of the AC source now by a factor of 10 up to 2,000 hertz, 2 kilohertz, I'll readjust to get back up to 5 volts. There we are. And I'm down to 0.4 volts across the capacitor. So as we discussed up here, as the frequency goes up, the capacitive reactance or, or capacitance AC resistance goes down. It comes closer to a short circuit. We lose most of the voltage across the resistor, and just a little bit is left for the capacitor. That's how capacitors work in an AC circuit. Show it. One of the most common applications or uses of capacitors is to decouple a power supply circuit. What the heck does that fancy word mean? It means to make it quiet when it would otherwise be noisy. Here I put together this little circuit, a couple of integrated circuits. Uh, it doesn't really do anything except generate some pulses, but it will illustrate our purpose. Uh, if you look at the oscilloscope, the top trace are the, are the pulses. And I'll expand it out here and you can see that a little bit that this circuit is putting out and the bottom trace is act the actual power supply terminal of that integrated circuit and you can see every time this switches we get a little noise on here quite a bit of noise this is one volt per division so that's a whole volt worth, worth of noise you can imagine if you had a big printed circuit board with lots of ICs doing lots of switching and lots of things going on the power supply gets very very noisy and that'll keep the circuit from functioning the way it's designed if you're familiar with motherboards or any kind of boards, you see capacitors sprinkled all around that board, usually around the periphery, but also in, inside. Those are decoupling capacitors, and here's what they do. Those are connected to the power voltage rail and ground right near the integrated circuits. That's what I'll do right here. There, the noise is gone. Just with that capacitor. Very, very important characteristic of capacitors. Take it out back in. Take it out. There's the noise on the supply rail. Put it back in. Noise is gone. Ta-da! Oh, you ready? <laughs> <laughs>